All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It is a little bit of a different time than when we normally meet. This is our fourth session of the Emerald Ashbor University for this uh, semester. Um, right. We've heard from a lot of good people so far. And today we're going to hear from another really good one. We're going to be talking to Vince Burkle today. Uh, I'm going to let him introduce his uh, title and information for you. I have the opportunity to work with Vince quite a bit, and I'm really eager to hear what he has to say. So, Vince, uh, it's all yours. Hey, thanks, Bob. Thanks again for uh, inviting me on here. Um, as Bob mentioned, I'm Vince Burkle. I'm with the Indiana Department of Natural Resources Division of Entomology and Plant Pathology. And I've had a little bit of a role change within our division within the last four months. Uh, I became assistant director to our division uh, in May. Uh, I also run survey throughout the state, uh, but at the same time, I'm still doing my old job as well. So I'm still also a nursery inspector. Uh, I cover uh, 10 counties here in Northeast Indiana from, from basically Wells and Adams and Huntington and North. Uh, so basically the whole Northeast corner uh, of Indiana. I've been here 17 years. And so uh, just uh, been around and seen a lot of different things from Emerald Ash Borer, Spongy Moth, uh, and now to our newest uh, pest problem, spotted lanternfly. So what we're gonna kind of talk about today, uh, it's kind of in our, our agenda. Um, first, we're gonna do just a little bit of a biology lesson on, on here. I don't know how many of you are familiar with spotted lanternfly and what it is, uh, but we'll just do a, a brief biology lesson, talk a, bit about it, a little bit about it, its feeding habits and the damage that it causes. Uh, we'll talk about how it spreads uh, the treatments and the surveys that we've done. And, and throughout those sections, I'll also talk about some tips and tricks that we, and, and some challenges that we've had uh, as, we, as we try to treat this insect, as we, as we try to prevent its spread, and as we survey for it. And then also at the end there, uh, just a, a brief slide on what you guys can all do if you do see spotted lanternfly and how to report it. So first off, what is spotted lanternfly? Well, spotted lanternfly, uh, scientific name Lycorma delicatula, uh, it's, a, it's a true bug. It's in the order Hemiptera, which is related to stink bugs, aphids, cicadas, uh, you know, other plant hoppers uh, like the full gourd plant hoppers uh, that, that usually will affect, uh, you know, a variety of different plants. Uh, they have a piercing sucking mouth part, which basically is like a needle that they insert into plant tissue that they then draw out the sap uh, for, for their food source. And this insect is native to Southeast Asia. So, uh, you know, trade becomes uh, at the forefront where, where we get a lot of these invasive species starting to move back and forth between our country and some of the Southeast Asian countries. Because we do a lot of trade with, uh, with those uh, parts of the world. So, um, you know, insects coming on containers or ships or, or whatever uh, are becoming more of a problem, it seems, because of the increased trade that we have. Um, spotted lantern fly, again, one generation per year. Uh, it, uh, right about this time of year, it's September to November, uh, uh, you're seeing uh, um, the adults, you know, flying around. Um, they don't really fly a whole lot, but uh, they generally just kind of walk around and then you know, will jump if disturbed. They're also laying eggs at this time. So the egg masses are present, usually starting about the uh, middle of September. Uh, and then the adults will usually get killed off by the first frost. And then those egg masses are present uh, from, again, September through uh, hatching time, which is sometimes April, May, depending on what latitude you live in. Uh, when those eggs hatch, uh, you have a first instar nymph that emerges out of that. That will then molt and shed its skin to a second instar. It will shed its skin again and become a third instar, usually sometime in the middle parts of June to early July. And then in the fourth end stars, the last stage uh, of the nymphal uh, stage, uh, usually sometime in July before it then sheds its skin into the adult again, sometime in late July. So <clears throat> we do have spotted lanternfly here in Indiana. Uh, most of you are probably aware of the Huntington and the Switzerland County sites. Switzerland County was found uh, in July of 2021. Huntington was uh, July of 2022 last summer. But more recently, we have now found it in Elkhart uh, about three, about two months ago, two and a half, three months ago, and then in Mishawaka uh, back in August uh, in northern Indiana. So we do have two new sites uh, that we have here in Indiana um, that, uh, you know, that we're dealing with uh, up, in, up in the northern part of the state. Did I 
let's just get the slide. There we go. So egg masses. Um, again, get a little bit of a detail here on these. September to May is when egg masses are typically present. They overwinter in this stage. Um, the female then, when she starts to lay these eggs, the eggs are actually, if you can kind of see on this bottom picture to the left, uh, the eggs are actually kind of looks like little kernels of wheat, you know, laid down in rows. And then the female will then cover this, these eggs with a, with a kind of a, a material that the coating that almost looks like sort of dried mud when it dries out. Initially, it will look more like silly putty. If any of you remember silly putty from, from way back when, I don't even know if they still have silly putty anymore, uh, but it's, it's got a similar sort of clay like consistency to it that they covered it, these eggs with to protect them. But as that material dries, it will then crack uh, over the winter time and, and just kind of dry out, change color slightly to more of a grayish uh, color and uh, look more like dried mud. Each one of these masses contains anywhere from 30 to 50 eggs, and they will typically hide these eggs just about anywhere uh, on flat surfaces. So it makes it, uh, you know, they can be really difficult to find and they will typically hide them under things and, and uh, inside things. So just to kind of give you an idea. So this is a hackberry tree. There are egg masses on this hackberry tree. Um, I'll, I'll give you all just kind of a quick minute here to just kind of look this over to see if you can kind of figure out where they're at. Um, but hackberry bark is very, very difficult to search egg masses for. Um, now, if any of you guys had a chance to look here, the egg masses are right there, right in the middle. And you can kind of see them blown up here. So again, hackberry bark looks very much like the egg masses. Some, you know, some of the plates and some of the porky ridges uh, are very similar looking to, to spotted lanternfly eggs, makes it very, very difficult to see the egg masses when they're on hackberry. The nymphs, after they hatch, uh, generally go through four instars, as I've previously mentioned. The first three instars are all black, with white spots. When they first hatch out of the egg, they're roughly about 3 sixteenths of an inch or so long. And then each instar can, gets a little bit bigger from there on out. The last instar, uh, they shed their skin and they turn more of a reddish color with some black striping and some white spots. And you can begin to see, uh, you can kind of see right here uh, on, on this fourth instar uh, nymph, you can kind of see the wing, put, wing uh, buds starting to form a little bit on the, on the fourth instar nymph. And, uh, you know, that's, that's uh, typical of insects as they grow a little bit, little bit bigger in, in, in their nymphal stages. You can start to see uh, wing buds on, on some, of these, uh, some, of these, some of these insects. They're also extremely strong jumpers. Um, you know, it's almost like somebody flicked them off a springboard when you, when you come around and try to grab them. They'll, just, they'll spring right off. They're very good jumpers. The adults, again, sometimes they will emerge as, as early as late July. Typically, it's more into August. They're about an inch long. Their forewings are sort of a tannish color with black spots and some modeling out towards the tips. And then their hind wings are red and, and uh, black with white stripes on them and then also some black spots. And then when they, they usually rest with their wings folded up over their back and sometimes that reddish underwing color can shine through that those four wings, giving them sort of a uh, almost a purplish tint. Uh, so typically you'll see people, you know, say, oh, then they might have a purplish tint on their wings. The actual wings are more of a tannish color if you fold them out away from that reddish color from out away from the four wings. Uh, and again, when you when you approach these adults, they will jump. And since they do have wings, they can fly, but it's not really a, a sustained flight. Uh, they generally will jump and then just sort of flutter and then zigzag and, and kind of zip their way back into a tree branch or onto a tree trunk to hide. Um, once that happens also, the, you know, the feed, they, they feed all year long, but the females, they must feed in order to produce eggs. Uh, and they can actually produce more than one egg mass if the season lasts long enough into November before we get some freezing temperatures to kill them off. So that's, there's a chance that a female could lay multiple egg masses. If we have a, have a, a, a long fall at some warmer weather. They're also an extremely gregarious insect in that they like to kind of hang out together. Um, this was a tree here in Huntington uh, from last summer that had over 100 adults on it. 
Uh, and then, of course, the same picture with the fourth instar nymphs there on the left. Uh, multiple insects kind of hanging out there in Huntington uh, on a tree of heaven. So uh, this can be kind of useful uh, when we're treating trees. They, they like to congregate together. So, you know, the more insects you get on a single tree, the, you know, and if you treat that tree, obviously you're, you're, you're killing a lot more insects by, by treating single trees uh, than having to go out and spray a, a whole bunch of different trees. There are also some biological challenges uh, with this insect. There is, because there are a lot of, a lot of lookalikes that, that are native insects. Um, you can see here on the, on the picture on the right, we have several different insects that can mimic or, or look similar to spotted lanternfly. Uh, we get a lot of calls about these on our hotline um, where people think they may have seen spotted lanternfly when in fact it's, it's a different insect especially the tiger moth. Uh, it's usually sort of the, the uh, virgin tiger moths and some of those similar species look very, very similar to spotted lanternfly. Uh, same with the underwing moths. I don't have a picture of those on here, but again, they have more of a mottled a forewing, a very brightly colored hindwing. We also get a lot of calls regarding uh, box elder bugs, which this picture on the left these are all box elder bugs, and they do look somewhat similar to the fourth instar nymphs. But one thing to keep in mind with box elder bugs is that the, the life stages typically don't match up together with when spotted lanternfly nymphal stages are around. Um, usually, these, these pictures of the box elder bug were taken just this fall, uh, back in August, and so. Spotted lanternfly nymphs, uh, the fourth instar nymphs are typically out in July. So you've got about a month differential there on when the two appear. Feeding habits, again, piercing sucking mouth part. Um, and as you can kind of see, uh, you've got a, uh, this spotted lanternfly here on the lower left has its mouth parts inserted into a grape uh, leaf and it's got its right into the petiole sucking sap out. Um, that's they do suck uh, the sap that they don't use actually is excreted. They use uh, only a portion of that sap that they ingest, and that's excreted as a sticky liquid called honeydew, which coats uh, leaves and, and trunks of trees and vegetation under the tree and the ground. Um, this will also attract wasps and flies and butterflies. It also grows a black sooty mold, and this sooty mold can actually coat leaves so thickly that it can reduce photosynthesis on some of the surrounding uh, uh, vegetation. It can re reduce the ability for some of those plants to produce their own food. Also, sometimes that, that honeydew will ferment and you'll start to smell sort of an alcoholic, uh, you know, like an alcohol sort of smell, uh, like a fermentation smell from the alcohols, uh, from the bacteria digesting the sugars in the honeydew. Uh, so that's also, you know, one one aspect of, uh, you know, what happens when you have honeydew being excreted uh, by the spotted lanternfly. This is true also, though, for, for a lot of different uh, insects that excrete honeydew. Uh, if you get enough of it, you'll get other insects attracted to it. You'll get honeydew uh, um, coating leaves and you'll get sooty mold coating leaves. Uh, the thing about it is spotted lanternfly is usually in such great numbers that you can actually feel the honeydew raining down on you if you're under a heavily infested tree. Um, little droplets are dripping on you, so you can actually feel that. So what about the damage? So they feed on over 70 different types of trees and plants. Uh, they prefer the invasive tree of heaven, but will also feed on quite a, other, uh, quite a few other trees. Namely, grape is one of their favorites. Walnut is also a preferred tree. They will also feed on maple, roses, sumac, birch, and several other trees. Heavy feeding can cause yield loss on grapes, and that's been that's been proven. And it also puts a lot of stress on trees. Although some of the newest research that that I've seen uh, shows that uh, a healthy tree is able to to withstand any kind of attack from tree of heaven, or I'm sorry, from spotted lanternfly, uh, just mainly because some of these trees are not their preferred host. They will feed on them, uh, but generally they're going more after the grape the uh, tree of heaven and, and kind of the black walnut. So those are really our concerns right there. Uh, sooty mold also, again, can, can reduce foliage uh, from producing photosynthesis. Uh, and that then re can result in stress. And then again, as the population grows, you will have a huge amount of spotted lanternfly, which makes it a, a huge nuisance. 
As far as uh, some of these other plants that they feed on, uh, they do feed on them, on them at different times of the year. Uh, as you can see here, roses, they typically, roses and other perennials, they'll feed on them during the early parts of the year, May and June, usually in the first and second instar stages. Of course, grape and tree of heaven, they're feed on, fed on all year round. That's really a preferred host plant. Black walnut, they'll usually pick up in, in, the, uh, in the summer months and then, then in the fall. River birch, again, in the fall, willow and sumac as well. And then maple, they'll feed on in the spring and the fall. And uh, a lot of times, too, uh, what we see uh, here in Indiana and, and probably true in other states as well is tree of heaven sometimes is a little bit drought sensitive. And when we have a, a long, prolonged drought like we kind of just had here in Indiana uh, back in August and through uh, the middle part of September, tree of heaven starts to shut down and starts to drop their leaves. Um, so you kind of see a shift of the spotted lanternfly feeding from going from tree of heaven onto some more maple trees that, uh, that uh, you know, don't drop their leaves quite as early or, or shut down quite as quickly. So the spotted lanternfly are kind of moving around, trying to find trees to pull nutrients out of once the tree of heaven is, is uh, shutting down and dropping leaves. So again, how did it get here? Well, the thought is that it hitched a ride as egg masses on, on a stone shipment from Asia in about 2020, 2012. And it was first detected in Berks County, Pennsylvania in 2024. So if you kind of look at this map here, uh, Berks County, Pennsylvania is the red dot right there in Eastern Pennsylvania. Now this map was, was, uh, was made in September of 2023. So just basically a few, a few weeks ago. And uh, you can kind of see how, how much it has spread uh, from that initial infestation point where it was first found in 2014. So it's moved its way around uh, quite a bit, you know, in the eastern seaboard and making its way westward uh, towards Indiana. And of course, now the most, uh, I had to kind of create this map because they don't have an updated one yet, but now we have Elkhart and Mishawaka, uh, St. Joe and Elkhart counties in northern Indiana where we have infestations. Um, that we have to deal with here in Indiana. So how does it spread here uh, in the states? Well, this insect can easily be moved by us. You know, unintentionally, uh, we can move egg masses or adults or nymphs on just about anything, on our cars, trains are, are a, a big way that these things can move around, firewood, anything that's sitting outside, old tires, uh, landscape stone, boulders, uh, picnic tables, just about anything. And as you can kind of see here uh, in some of the photos, we have an old semi, uh, semi trailer uh, that's got egg masses caked on the tires. We got logs laying on the ground that have egg masses caked all over them. And of course, the rail lines are a big way these things can move from the East Coast to the West Coast. And so if you kind of look at this map, um, you can kind of see some of the rail lines on the left, some of the major rail lines moving uh, you know, throughout the eastern United States. And you kind of compare this to the distribution of spotted lanternfly on the map to the right. You can kind of see how it's moving into Indiana. So this rail line right here is a major rail line that runs, that starts in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. It's double track the whole way and moves up through Ohio, Indiana, Indiana, and across northern Indiana to Chicago. You also have rail lines moving from Harrisburg down through uh, the Piedmont areas uh, of Virginia and the mountains of Virginia, as well as rail lines moving up north uh, into New York and over to Buffalo. Rail lines are, are a real challenging uh, uh, way that this uh, insect is, is an easy way for this insect to move and a real challenge for us to deal with. So what are some tips to preventing spread? Well, the main tip is if you're in an infested area and, and no in spotted lantern flies there, be sure to just look over your vehicle. So the picture out here is uh, my vehicle, you know, my state vehicle here where I was sitting at the site in Huntington and I just happened to look up and I saw a spotted lantern fly crawling, crawling across the windshield. Um, so every time we are actually at this site, especially during, you know, the summertime when, when the, uh, the nymphs or the adults are active, we're looking over our vehicles before we leave because we certainly don't want to transport these insects to a new location and cause a new infestation. 
challenges to preventing spread are, again, this thing will hitch rides on anything. Uh, it'll hide on your vehicle. It'll hide under your vehicle where it's not easy to see. Uh, and one trick that we kind of use and, and other government officials will use is uh, inspection mirrors. Sometimes we can't get, you know, see clear, clear underneath our vehicles uh, to see if any insects are crawling around or hiding underneath there. So we can use a mirror then to kind of look underneath to inspect. And I know Pennsylvania also uses this and other states when they're inspecting uh, semis or, or other uh, transportation um, you know, modes that are leaving the infested, er infested area. Uh, they'll take these mirrors and they'll kind of look underneath things just to make sure there's nothing hitching a ride. Another challenge is making sure we get our message across to some of the tree care uh, and professionals that we have here uh, in Indiana. Um, you know, tree debris can, can harbor egg masses and it can also harbor uh, other life stages, the nymphs and the adults. Um, Anything that uh, can't be chipped up, we, we've been working with some tree care companies you know, that are inside infested areas to make sure that they leave larger material on site that we can kind of look at it before that material leaves you know, an infested area. And this was actually a really large tree of heaven in Huntington uh, that was getting removed. It's probably 36 inches in diameter. And the tree trimmer uh, trimmed the tree down, cut it up, chipped what they could, and left the other material there for us to look at and uh, before they were before they moved it off site and we actually scraped over 100 egg masses off of this debris uh, before we allowed it to move and again railroads are a huge challenge um, really difficult to access railroad property for survey work lots of hiding places on rail cars um, rail cars also can travel thousands of miles in just a few days or they may you know, you may have a train originating in an infested area and a, and a rail car ends up having to be set off because it's got some problems with some wheel bearings or something. And it has to go sit at the on a siding for, you know, a few months or and then you have the opportunity for insects to jump off or eggs to hatch. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunity for for spread through the rail lines. There's also a big safety concern uh, for us as we survey along rail lines. Uh, and rightfully so, obviously, you know, some of these rail lines have quite a few trains running through on them a day, and we want to make sure that we're safe and, and out of the way if any of these trains come through. Also, Tree of Heaven is a very common tree along rail lines uh, and industrial areas where rail lines generally run through. Um, so there's plenty of food source, you know, along these rail lines for spotted lanternfly to feed upon, you know, if they're going to hop off. What about our surveys? So in Switzerland County, back in 2021, um, when we first found out about it uh, down there, we found that it was infesting about 100 acres of woodlot. Uh, and this is, uh, this is about two miles north of the Markland Dam. I don't know how, uh, you know, if y'all are familiar with Switzerland County and, and VV, Indiana, uh, which is in far southeastern Indiana along the Ohio River. Uh, but this is just north of the Markland Dam, or about six miles northeast of VV, Indiana. And this woodlot uh, that we initially found the spotted lanternfly at has got a lot of tree of heaven in it. And in some areas of the woods, it's just almost pure stands of tree of heaven. Um, we did a lot of survey work in the surrounding areas. And then you know, once we did this survey work, we determined that the, init that the initial infestation was just basically right here in this centralized location, this 100 acre woodlot uh, right here in, in, uh, in Switzerland County, again, about two miles north of the Markland Dam. Now this site is a really, really challenging site. Um, Southern Indiana is known for some, a lot of hills and valleys, and this site is no different. We got a lot of steep slopes with a lot of thick understory of, of multifloral rose, honeysuckle, privet, Japanese stilt grass, it's really difficult to navigate this this uh, this site. Um, we're only dealing with about initially. We we're only dealing with about three or four landowners, but those landowners are all hunters, and they wanted us off the property by September first, so we so we didn't spook any of the deer uh, out of their uh, out of their areas. The other problem is there is lots of chicks and ticks and chiggers down there, as you can see by uh, by this photo. Uh, this duct tape is literally covered with a bunch of seed ticks. 
And so uh, every time we go down there, we have to be very cautious, you know, about the ticks. We have to make sure we have our, our repellents on and, and, and making sure our clothing is treated with uh, repellents. Uh, and then also just kind of keep an eye on our, our health to make sure if we do have a tick that's embedded that we we're looking for, you know, telltale signs of, of targeting and, and stuff like that for, uh, for some of the diseases that ticks can transmit. This is just uh, to show what the thick understory looks like at this site. As you can see, it's, it's a really difficult site, a lot of, lot of heavy understory, uh, a lot of places for not only spotted lanternfly adults and nymphs to hide, but also a lot of places for them to lay egg masses. Uh, so it makes it very, very challenging uh, you know, at this site to, to do any kind of survey work. Now, Huntington's quite a bit different. Uh, this location is uh, just to the west of the downtown area along the Little River. Um, so the surveying is a little bit easier. Uh, however, there, we do have our, our set of challenges there as well. Um, the urban, it's, a, it's an urban area, so we're dealing with lots of different landowners, uh, hundreds of different landowners. And part of the challenge is securing permission to go on each person's property to be able to survey for egg masses or, or adult or, or nymphal stages. Um, there's also a lot of opportunity for offsite movement here. Uh, the, the core site is, uh, there's, a, there's a truck transfer station at the core area, so there's a lot of semi-traffic moving in and out. Uh, Norfolk Southern has a, has a, has a main uh, line that runs right adjacent to the site. So there's a, there's a slight risk there for movement, if, but however, the trains generally going through there are moving pretty fast. So the risk, the risk for, for movement via trains, unless something were to stop right there, which typically they don't, is, is pretty small. There's also just, you know, just with the sheer number of, of residents that live there, there's, there's the potential for a lot of movement uh, on vehicles uh, and things like that, you know, offsite. So that makes it a real challenge for us to try to make sure we're educating, you know, enough people to be able to look under their cars and to inspect their cars before they're moving long distances. Survey in Elkhart and Mishawaka, again, is a bit different. Um, so like I said, we just found this, these two infestations within the past few months, and these have been found along the rail lines. Uh, again, right along that main rail line that comes out of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. This is an extremely busy rail corridor that goes right into Chicago. You're looking at up to 100 trains per day on this rail line. And there's also a huge rail yard uh, at, this, uh, at the main infestation site in Elkhart. Again, big challenge working with the rail yards. Uh, securing permission to be on, these, on the railroad property is, is just a real obstacle to our survey work. And, um, you know, we are working with the railroads. We've been communicating with them, uh, trying to get permission, uh, but uh, it just takes some time. Um, there's a lot of paperwork that's involved with that. Um, the insurance is, is a big deal. The railroads are obviously concerned with the safety of anybody that's around their property. And uh, so there's, there's that real concern there. We haven't done any treatments here yet, uh, just because of the fact that we are still working through these challenges. Uh, but one thing uh, that the railroads typically like to have on hand uh, is a flagger. And so, you know, that's just a railroad worker that is on site while we're doing survey work or whether we're doing treatments. Uh, they're making sure that we're staying safe and that we're aware of any trains that might be coming into the area. Uh, this is quite an expensive thing to have though. Uh, they usually charge about $750 an hour to have a flagger on site. Uh, so that's something that we have to work through as well uh, is, is the cost of, of making sure everybody's safe and, and the railroad has you know, their personnel on hand and on site to make sure everyone's safe. This is just showing the, an aerial of the rail yard that's here in Elkhart. The red dot on the right side is where the infestation is. Um, we actually had a trap there this summer. That's how we initially picked up that there was an infestation there. And uh, this rail yard, um, you can see that it's, it's fairly large, about three miles long and about a third of a mile wide. Several tracks leading in from the east where trains will just kind of come in and, and sit and wait for their turn to get into the yard. 
there's plenty of opportunity for spotted lanternfly coming in from other areas from the East Coast or from Pennsylvania or Ohio, even to jump off here. And again, there's a lot of tree ahead along the railroad uh, rail line here in Elkhart. So um, quite a challenging, uh, challenging situation for us there. So moving on to treatments. In Switzerland County, we have been doing treatments every year since we first found the location there in 2021. And initially, uh, in 2021, we did some broadcast and basal bark treatments uh, with the assistance of uh, Pennsylvania Department of Ag, who kind of came in uh, just to kind of show us how they did things out there. Uh, they brought in some personnel. They brought in one of their spray rigs that's mounted in the back of a truck. Uh, and we did some insecticidal treatments with dinotepuron. Uh, on site in Switzerland County. In 2022 and 2023, we, we switched to basal bark treatments uh, of dinotepuron, and, uh, and we've been treating uh, uh, several hundred trees and several hundred sites in, in, down in that area. As a matter of fact, we've done 435 locations, and most of those are tree of heaven. We have done a few walnut and some box elder and a little bit of grape, uh, but mostly that's been been tree of heaven that we've treated down there at the, at the site in Switzerland. Uh, used about 20 gallons of dinotepuron mix in 2023. And we are getting some pretty good success uh, down there. Uh, dinotepuron is a very good product. It uptakes rather quickly and we're getting some pretty good control. Our, our, some of our challenges though are that it's very difficult to get equipment in there. Uh, that's why we have to use backpack sprayers. Um, the terrain uh, just makes it really, really tough. Um, subsequent treatments, uh, you know, with backpack sprayers are working pretty well. Um, we also had to do a lot of timing uh, with our treatments to avoid injury to pollinators. Um, tree of Heaven generally flowers sometime in June. Uh, so we generally timed our treatments after the trees were done flowering. Um, and then that way we get some longer control on into the fall. We only need to make one application uh, so that we get a good amount of control uh, for uh, controlling these, these spotted lanternfly. Um, one other thing we're dealing with down there is some, some property owners are refusing us entry under their properties. Uh, we have seen a little bit of spread down there, uh, not too much uh, away from the, from the core area. Uh, but we are getting a little bit of spread and we are getting some some homeowners who just don't want us on their property. There's also some properties that have some farm animals, animals that, uh, that we got to deal with. As you can see here, we have a very inquisitive horse that's uh, wanting to check out what we have in the back of our vehicles. Um, those horses would follow us around, uh, you know, on the site, you know, for a short distance. And finally, they kind of got bored with us and kind of moved along. Uh, and again, the ticks and chiggers are, are a real issue down there. Uh, in southern Indiana. We also did some herbicide treatments down there, and this is kind of the, one of the tricks that we use to try to help manage spotted lanternfly a little bit more efficiently. Um, we ended up treating uh, tree of heaven that were less than up to about three inches in diameter so that we could knock out those smaller trees and then drive the spotted lanternfly to the larger trees that we had treated with, with dinotepuron. Um, this not only reduces the amount of, of uh, host plants that we have there for them to feed on, but it also allows us to treat fewer trees, you know, dinotepuron, and be more effective and more efficient with our treatments. As you can kind of see here, we're, we're treating with, with backpack sprayer um, with dinotepuron on some of these four to five inch diameter trees uh, down in Switzerland County. Treatments in Huntington, again, we're doing pretty much the same thing with dinotepuron, although we, we're, we got a little bit easier of a time. We don't have the difficulty with the terrain and, and things like that. Uh, this large tree of heaven that you see here on the right uh, actually was the same tree that was cut down in, in one of the previous slides there. Um, we had treated that tree uh, with, with dinotepuron with backpack sprayers. Um, we're, we're uh, not doing any herbicide treatments here because there's generally a, a, um, a lot of the smaller trees are basically root sprouts from larger trees. And, you know, killing some of these smaller trees may affect the larger trees in a negative way, cause them to be stressed or even cause them to die. And since we're dealing with, with an urban area with a lot of houses, 
we don't want to have a lot of large dead trees that then somebody has to remove. Uh, so we ended up, and not only that, the density of tree I have in here isn't quite as much as it is down in, in Switzerland County. Uh, so we weren't using any herbicide treatments there. We did treat 175 locations with dinotepuron here. A lot of these locations had multiple trees. Uh, and uh, some trees anywhere from about two to three inches in diameter all the way up to some trees, you know, 36 plus inches in diameter. We used 29 gallons of mix here. And the rate, we're using the high rate of dinotepuron, which is about 2.4 ounces per gallon. So egg mass scraping is another, uh, is another tool that we're using to try to eliminate uh, spotted lanternfly. So between the two sites, we've scraped almost 17,000 egg masses. Um, most of these has, have been in Huntington just because of the challenges that we've dealt with down in Switzerland County and all the, all the areas that the egg masses can hide. Um, and Huntington is just a much easier location to destroy egg masses. But again, just like I was mentioning before with the treatments, the challenge is, is securing permission to be on each homeowner's property here. Um, but again, 17,000 egg masses almost were, were destroyed. This equals, you know, on an average of about 40 egg masses per, or 40 eggs per egg mass, you're looking at almost 700,000 eggs that were destroyed over the winter time. So we think we put a pretty, put a pretty good dent in the spotted lanternfly population there, in, 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 especially in Huntington. Uh, but but there is still quite a bit of work to do. And, and, and we did uh, do some more treatments here, you know, this summer to try to try to reduce and, and, uh, and uh, reduce the population even more. So there is a little bit of a trick uh, to try to finding and, and destroying egg masses. First off, you kind of got to get a little bit dirty. Um, like I said, these egg masses can be found anywhere. Uh, we've, we're finding them on foundations, under logs, uh, under bark, uh, on fences. And one of the tricks to scraping and smashing egg masses is, is obviously first using a scraper, but you have to really kind of smash them first uh, and then scrape them off. Uh, smashing them and ensures that all the eggs are destroyed uh, before, before you physically scrape them off. If you just scrape them off, the eggs just generally kind of break up and fall onto the ground. So smashing them and, and then you can kind of hear them pop. It's almost like Rice Krispies when you're smashing them. You know, you're, you're kind of smashing, uh, you know, the goo comes out of the eggs. Um, <clears throat> so that's a good indication that they're dead. And then you can just kind of scrape them off and, and remove the, the old egg mass. Another little trick that we have is that we have a, a very long extendable pole that we've, we found on Amazon. And, and this pole has a has a squeegee, a, a small squeegee on one end and a grout brush, brush on the other. And this allows us to extend this pole up into the trees. We can reach, we, this pole will extend up to about 30 feet, uh, but it is, uh, becomes quite difficult to kind of, kind of hold that pole up when you get it up that high. It, it gets a little bit, of, bit wobbly and, and a little bit hard to maneuver and get it to where you want it. And one of the other challenges is that that squeegee head screws onto the end of the pole. So when you put pressure on on a tree trunk, when you're trying to scrape something, sometimes it'll unscrew itself. But this tool has been really handy uh, to reach up and get egg masses uh, higher up in trees. We'll, we'll usually use the squeegee end just to kind of squash them and, and then flip it over and use the brush to try to brush them off. Uh, so that's been a, a, a real good tool for us to have. Uh, to be able to scrape egg masses higher up the trees. <clears throat> and then, you know, we got quite a bit of uh, egg masses, again, that hide on different places. Uh, certainly the hackberry is, is difficult to see egg masses on. You know, we got winter creeper climbing up on, on, on trees that, we, that, the, that they'll hide egg masses on. We've got rocks, boulder piles. We got plywood laying on the ground that will flip over and there'll be hundreds of egg masses. And this U, this, this one taxis here in Huntington, this is about a 25 foot by 25 foot uh, U. And we scraped almost 1700 egg masses out of that because the bark is, the, the diameter of the, the branches is so large that it's, that it's just peeling off and the, and the spotted lantern fire getting in behind those flaking bark pieces and they're laying all their egg masses on there. So uh, we spent about half a day in that thing scraping egg masses and, and getting them out of that U. It was, uh, 
which was cut quite a challenge. And also there's an old factory on site uh, at the Huntington location. You can kind of see here the, the rafters and, and some of these, you know, some of the support poles, you know, on this, uh, this old overhang, you can kind of see the egg masses that are splattered on the, on the rafters and, and those poles. And again, that, that extendable pole that we have is a handy tool to be able to extend up into those rafters to be able to scrape those egg masses off. Another thing we're doing, and this is uh, this has become quite popular with a, with a, with a lot of uh, uh, you know a lot of people here in the state. Um, we're using uh, some canines to to train in order to try to sniff out some of the egg masses. Um, this is uh, this has been fairly successful. But, uh, my colleague Callie Bontrager up in northeast Indiana or northwest Indiana has some Australian shepherds that she, she's been training. Uh, she's brought them down uh, to several locations to, to seek out egg masses. And initially what we would do is we would gather up egg masses and take them uh, to have them frozen to uh, minus 80 degrees Celsius to, where the, to the point where the egg masses were destroyed or they, they were no longer viable. And then we would train you know, the dogs on those egg masses when they were you know, put into to little to little tubes, and we'd set them around, and the dogs would go sniff them out. But we've learned that um, since then that dead egg masses smell a little bit different than live egg masses. So we switched over to uh, a new a new type of, uh, of technology called jet zent tubes, and we're using these tubes. They have a little polymer in that you can put in with an egg mass and this polymer will absorb the scent of a live egg mass. And you put the, the polymer in it for different amounts of time so that the egg mass, you know, kind of, so that it will absorb scent for different durations. And then we can set these jet set tubes out into the environment and train the dogs on what an actual live egg mass would smell like. So it's absorbing the actual scent of the live egg mass. Um, so that's been uh, that's been a real uh, a, a real plus for us and a good technology for us to use now that we're able to use live egg masses or the scent of live live egg masses to to train these dogs. Uh, this also means that we don't have to move egg masses off site to freeze them somewhere. Uh, you know we've been working with Huntington University, uh, you know, in a lab there at, at, uh, to. Uh, to, to put these uh, these polymers in with the egg masses, so that we don't have to move them out of the city, uh, and potentially you know spread spotted lantern fly to a new location. You know, one of the challenges though with these canines is, one, they can get distracted by rabbits. So when we're out uh, out in the field and we're out uh, having them sniff and, and and get trained, or if we're having them on site looking for actual egg my, egg masses. They might spook up an animal or might see a squirrel or something like that. And once that happens, they, they kind of lose their focus. And so they have to be kind of put away for a while uh, and then uh, so that they can kind of you know, settle down. And, and then after a period of time, we can take them back out again. So that that's one challenge. And then also they do require daily training to reinforce uh, the fact that, you know, they need to stay focused on on their job uh, to look for egg masses. So what can you do? Well, first, um, you can spread the word about spotted lanternfly. If you see spotted lanternfly or you see, even see something that you think might be spotted lanternfly, report it. If it is spotted lanternfly, kill it and collect it or take a photo of it. Uh, you can call our 866 No Exotic Hotline, which is listed there. You can also email our email account, depp at dnr.in.gov. You can send photos through that uh, email, and you can also, if you would, please leave detailed information about your location, what county you're from, or even city. That way we can send the appropriate inspector out to, uh, to contact you and, and to take a look around the area where you've seen the insect. Um, you can also contact your local DNR inspector, and I've got our, our inspector territory map here on the right. And then, or you can report it to EDRR or report IN websites or the apps. Um, those uh, apps uh, all have information that come through our channels so that we're able to also, uh, you know, track down, you know, uh, information through there and, and follow up on any reports 
you know, spotted lanternfly that that uh, have been reported through those sites. I appreciate all your guys' time. Thank you very much for, for listening in today. And uh, here's my contact information if you have any, uh, if you need to contact me about anything. But uh, right now, I think we can uh, open everything up for questions. All right. Thank you, Vince. Do we have any questions for him? Well, I am not seeing any pop up in the chat. Oh, maybe someone has one. Um, what was the, sorry, what was the app called again for the report? Here, I'll back it up. So we got EdMaps report or, or report IN. Uh, so it's edmaps.org slash Indiana is the website. Or uh, I think the app's on the app store as well. Um, on, on the app stores for, for Android and both both Android and iPhone. An another question, uh, and maybe it's answered by your Amazon poll, <laughs> but uh, I wondered how far up the trunk uh, uh, egg masses are typically laid, but it looks like it could be anywhere. I had heard that it was effective to put burlap around a trunk, and then when they climb up under that to check period, we could I could check periodically and then scrape away the masses. Is that an effective strategy? Well, possibly because they can, they will lay their eggs and, and hide under things like that. However, that that strategy is generally more for spongy moth. Uh, okay, but it, it probably could be adapted for spotted lanternfly. Now, I know they're they're trying to develop uh, some new technologies. It's, it's sort of like what they call an egg mass trap, and I think they call it a lampshade sort of trap, where it's where it's they use some. Uh, uh, it looks almost like a lampshade, and it's got like roofing shingles on it. Yes. And the spotted lanternfly then will will kind of climb up underneath that and lay their eggs kind of underneath that shade, if you will. And then you know that's a good way and an easy way, you know, once you remove that shade to be able to destroy egg masses. Now, as as we have we have seen egg masses laid all over the place. We've seen them laid higher up in trees, and that's kind of you know, out east. They'd always say, "Oh, spotted lanternfly typically likes to lay eggs, you know, nine meters up in the tree." It hasn't necessarily been our experience, and it also depends on you know the amount of cover they might have on the ground, mm -hmm. uh, because if you've got a lot of understory shrubbery or invasive species, there's plenty of cover you know, down on the lower portions of the trunks for them to lay eggs. Yes. We've also experienced, you know, especially uh, if, you, if you're in a forested area where you have a lot of leaf litter, you know, especially if the leaf litter is on smaller trees piled up around the trunks, those spotted lanternflies will go below that leaf litter and lay eggs at the bottom of the tree, right at the, right at the root flare. Um, and the same way, I'm sorry, go ahead. Very non-selective on their site, uh, chosen site. Yeah, they're they're non-selective. They're they're really more interested, I guess you could say, anth anthropomorphically speaking, in laying their eggs in some place they can hide them. Um, yes, we find them in piles of rocks. We find them underneath old siding that's laying on the ground, tires, trash cans, picnic tables, um, you name it. I mean, you know, the, that old abandoned factory is is got a lot of old semi trailers and things like that at it they're laying eggs underneath the semi trailers in between the, you know on the tires on the axles uh just about everywhere so another question if i may uh is there any ipm work being done with pheromones that might be uh uh have a, a positive trajectory at this point i think usda is working on some of that um I know they're they're also looking at biological controls. Good. Um, uh, pheromones. I think there's there's still there's still a ways to go on that. Very good. Uh, and Vince, I, I was just going to jump in here momentarily yeah. because of uh, someone mentioned the lampshade trap earlier. Mm -hmm. um, if you look on our EABU YouTube channel where this recording will be posted, you will also find one from Dr. Phil Lewis, and he actually goes through lampshade traps and their construction. If you're interested. 
Thank you both. Yeah, yeah and it's, it's kind of continuing with with uh, your question on on that. Uh, you know, there are there are some biological control biological fungus fungi that they're looking at. There's a uh, Batcoa fungus and then uh, um, a Bavaria fungus that they're looking at that might have that has some promise as a biological control agent for spotted lanternfly. Um, still in the early phases of that, but uh, but hopefully in the future we'll have some new technologies, some biological controls uh, that we can help manage these insects. Good, and I will you. also add here that USDA is looking at biological controls in terms of parasitoidal wasps that come from similar range that these insects do. However, it has been noted that they're notoriously hard to rear over in the United States. Yeah. They're just not very good in the lab. So there's a lot of work that still needs to be done there. Yep. Um, we did have a question added in the chat too. Someone's asking are the red and black, black bugs on milkweed harmful also. Uh, Vince, do you want to answer that one? No, I mean, milkweed plant bug is not really harmful. It's a native insect. I mean, they can, you know, if you're if you're a native plant enthusiast and you get a lot of them, uh, I suppose they could cause, you know, if you have a lot of insects feeding on a single milkweed plant, they could cause some problems there. But being a native insect, there's usually, uh, um, you know, not a, not a real problem with, with, with the milkweed, uh, it, you know, bug causing any real problems. Um, Usually I take their presence as a good sign. It means you have milkweed nearby and you'll hopefully get some monarchs and other things. That's right. Do we have any other questions for Vince? All right. I am not seeing any. So Vince, I just want to say thank you for donating your time to us today. We really appreciate it. Um, I'll also add to that um, you are going to get an email in about 24 hours or so from me with information on a survey you can take and hopefully an update on how the recording's going. Um, and I'll include anything relevant that Vince may want to send along, like if there's a handout or something like that. And please feel free to send in any questions you have. And Vince, do you have any last words before you go? Uh, other than thank you very much and I really appreciate all your guys' attention. All right, folks. Thank you very, very much, and you guys have a great rest of your week. Stay safe out there.